Parsha's Tzav. By Dabra Hashem Omoshali, Mor Tzav is Aaron with Zbanav Lemor, Zos Torah Saola. He haola al Mokta al Mizveach kol Laila at a Boker. This is the uh, description of the Korban Ola. And it has to be on the pyre, P Y R E, all night uh, until the morning. The Esham Mizveach took at Boker. Now, uh, here you have the command of how to do the, uh, uh, the Korban Ola. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the first, uh, uh, one of the first uh, rules is, uh, the first thing you notice, I had the Aliyah yesterday. So in the, in the Sefer Amakohi, in the Sefer Torah, you'll notice that the word in, 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 our, in, in the art scroll, the Mem is a small Mem, mm-hmm. right? Which means that that's how it appears in the Sefer Torah. I mean, certain letters, we have a tradition how they're written in the Sefer Torah. Some of them are written in, 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 in smaller, some of them are written bigger. And the mem, the mem, we have a tradition that this mem, the word mokda, fire, uh, is, is a small mem. So there are different opinions exactly what, what that means, what, what, what that means, why, why there's a small mem. But the, uh, uh, it just has a, almost, a, it's not the plain meaning, obviously it's not the plain meaning, but one of the, uh, the Kutzker Rebbe, the Kutzker Rebbe was a very, very, uh, uh, shall we say, poignant uh, in his comments. Uh, and, and he uh, uh, often hit on parts of our motivation, which it, it stings a little bit. When it stings, it means they're on target. Mm. So the Kutzker Rebbe said, you know, sometimes here's the word in the fire, the, the fire on the altar. Fire on the altar obviously represents our, you know, our divine service where we are a Mizbeach, we're trying to serve a Kodesh Borko and so on and so forth. So the, 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 uh, the, the Kutzker says, you know what? Keep your fire, your visible fire, small. The small mem means don't. Not everybody has to see how on fire you are. Uh, if you're, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Nobody needs to think that when you're davening, you're in an exercise center. Uh, uh, you, you know, keep you got a fire. Burn the fire inside as, as as much as it should. The fire should burn inside. But you don't have to make public announcements and public uh, advertisements of your of, of your enthusiasm for Yiddishkeit. Uh, you know, sometimes you see people davening, and they're, they're davening like this with all, with, with, all, uh, with all the gestures. You know, yeah, you know the, the Gedola Yisrael didn't daven like that. I don't know who exactly you're trying to put the show on for. Most people, when you daven like this, they see the show. They see, you know, just like you see the show by other people, they see your show as well. So all the, all the you know, the, you know that, that sort of thing, you know, you know, save it, save it. Nobody's impressed. And uh, 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 number one, the, 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 the Sfas Emes, so Zemes was one from the Gir dynasty. So Svas Zemes' father died when he was young. He was raised by his grandfather, the Kedusha Arim. So one Friday night, uh, they were sitting at the Shabbos table. And the Svas Zemes, you know, he took a piece of challah, a piece of fish, whatever it was, and he said, L'chlod Shabbos Kodesh. And he was about to eat it. And the Kedusha Arim, his grandfather said to him, it's enough to think it. You don't have to announce it. Hmm? What are you announcing it for? What do you know? You want to impress everybody else at the table? What a tzaddik. L'chvod Shabbos Kodesh. <laughs> His fourth helping of Cholm. L'chvod Shabbos Kodesh. <laughs> what a tzaddik. Yeah. You know, you don't have to announce it. If it's L'chvod Shabbos Kodesh, you can think it. L'chvod Shabbos Kodesh. What do you have to say it for? Right? And if you're saying it out loud, you're, you're putting on a show. Keep the fire. Keep the fire burning low. Keep it on a low, on a low burner. Right? Don't, don't turn the flame on too high. Your inner flame, of course, your inner flame should burn. There's no question about it. Okay? Now, the Torah then goes through the procedure over here. Um, by the way, do you know that the Gemara says that when Rabbi Yonah son ben Uziel, Hillel had 80 disciples. So the Gemara says the greatest of his disciples was Yonah son ben Uziel. And the least of his disciples, the smallest of his disciples, was Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was the leader of the Jewish people at the time of the second base of Mikdash. So the Gemara says Rabbi Yochanan, and he had 80 disciples. And Rabbi Yonah son ben Uziel was the greatest of his disciples. The Gemara says when Rabbi Yonah son ben Uziel would learn Torah, birds flying overhead would burn in the fire of his Torah. Right? Birds would, would burn in the fire. Rabbi Yonah son ben Uziel would learn Torah, birds would burn overhead. Right? So the commentaries ask, well, if that was the Talmud, if the Talmud could burn birds over his head with his Torah, if that was the Talmud, what was the Rebbe? If that was the Talmud, alone just realized it's being filmed. If that was the Talmud, what was the Rebbe, <laughs> right? <laughs> if that was the Talmud, being filmed and recorded. <laughs> yeah. If that was the Talmud, what was the Rebbe, right? That was, that's what the commentaries asked. That was the Talmud, what was the Rebbe? So the commentaries answer, commentaries answer, well, Yonas and Ben could burn the birds within four amos, four amos high, 
Hillel had long-term long-range bombers. You know, he could he could zap them out of the high skies. So that's what, that's one of the commentaries. It says both answers are kind of tongue in cheek. Both answers are kind of tongue in cheek. But the second answer is more also is is is, 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 is I like the second answer. The second answer is well, you know, some Israel burnt the birds. Hillel could control his fire. He didn't burn anything. The Rebbe can control his fire. I love that answer. Ron, you understand Ben Azil, I guarantee you can control his fire too. Whatever that fire means, that he used to burn birds flying overhead from the heat of his Torah. I don't know what it means exactly. The coin wears his garments, so with garment pants. This is fundamental Torah 101. The first service of the day, the coin Godel would go up on the altar. After the carbonos were burning at night, so there was ashes on top of the, that were left on top of the altar, a big pile of ashes, which was, by the way, called the tapuach. No, you're right, you're right, but the, you're right, but it's not right. That's what everybody says. Tapuach is an apple. The word the apple is called apple because of tapuach, not tapuach is because of an apple. The word tapuach in Hebrew means to be swollen, puffed up. The pile on the altar was called the, taf, the, the, the tapuach. Not because it was an apple, it's because it's a puffed up pile. The more ashes on the altar, the more devotion, a sign of devotion of the Jewish people, that there were many korbanos that were being burnt on the altar. So somehow somebody got hold of an apple when they decided to name the apple. I guess they called it the puffed one, so they called it a tapuach. But there wasn't the the, the 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 altar came before the apple, not the apple came before the altar. So so you're right. It's called it's called a tapuach. It's called an apple. So so the 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 idea of the the ashes on the altar represents the uh, devotion of Klai Shal, the Kodesh Baruch Hu, that we burnt so many that we shechted and burnt so many korbanos at night. Now in the morning when the kohen gadol would go up there, he would scoop out a pan full of ashes and take it down and place it at the base of the altar, at the base of the Mizbeach. Okay, now, it's called Trumas Hadeshen. Trumas Hadeshen meaning the removing of the ashes first thing in the morning to take a pan full of ashes. Now, what's the idea of that? What is the idea of, 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 of taking the ashes off the altar and putting them on the floor by the side of the altar? What's the idea? What do you think is the symbolism there? What's the symbolism? Why is the coin girl doing that? The coin, not the coin girl, the coin. Uh, so the commentary suggests two things. Uh, number one, it's symbolic of the idea our devotion to HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings the bracha. It's our devotion through Korbanos. Korbanos is symbolic. Of the, uh, the, the, the Gemara says that in the merit of the Korbanos, the world is the world that God provides sustenance for the world in the merit of the Korbanos service, of the, of, of, the, of the offering service. So what you're doing is you're taking it from the Mizbeach and putting it on the floor symbolically that the bracha comes down here the bracha we have down here comes because of those ashes which are on top of the mizbeach. That's symbol, symbol, symbol number one. Symbol number two is obviously to go and take the, uh, uh, what do you call it, to take the, uh, the, the pan and put it on the floor is a sign of humility. There's a certain sign of humility over there. The, the, we start the, the, the service before we get all the high and full of ourselves. We'll see this more with the coin gadol in a second. That it's, it's a sign of humility. Now, turn ahead. It says, Eish tamid to karal ha-mizbeach lo sikhbeh. There must be a constant fire on the altar, and you're not allowed to, uh, uh, you're not allowed to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you're not allowed to um, um, uh, extinguish it. So you can't take any logs off the fire. Eish tamid to karal ha-mizbeach lo sikhbeh. Don't extinguish the fire. So again, symbolically, uh, the commentaries say on a Musser level that it's the fire of Torah, that uh, if you have an opportunity for yourself or your children to learn Torah, you shouldn't prevent them from doing so, you shouldn't prevent yourself. Don't extinguish the fire of Torah. That's what the commentaries say. But uh, uh, there is based on, I think, the Arizal or the Shla Kodesh, a person who is plagued or a person who is suffering from inappropriate, immoral thoughts, saying this Pasuk is a skula, is some sort of benefit that helps a person avoid immoral thoughts. By saying this pasuk, a person is able to, uh, 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 somehow it dissolves away or melts away the inappropriate thoughts that a person is often, uh, is often bothered by. Okay. Now, in, uh, uh, in pasuk um, ches, take a look at v'zes Torah samincha. This is the, uh, 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 this is the, uh, um, the Torah of the mincha. Mincha is a meal offering. You have to bring the mincha offering, the meal offering. And how is it brought? 
Misolas Hamincha Umishamna, the Kohen takes a kometz of the flower of the Mincha, the Eskol Halavoma, and all of the frankincense, Asher Al Mincha, the Hikter Amizbeach Rech Nichoch Askarasal Hashem. That means like this. Pay attention carefully. A guy brings a meal offering, flour and oil mixed together. It's given to the Kohen. The Kohen brings it to the altar. How much of it is burnt on the altar? The Kohen takes a kometz. Do you know what a kometz is? Three fingers. Sticks in his fingers, takes whatever that individual Kohen could take in those three fingers, called a kometz, takes out three fingers full, scrapes off the top, scrapes off the bottom, with, takes the frankincense, and that is burnt on the altar. Okay, that's, the, that's what the Torah says. What's the idea behind it? Let's say the behind taking a kometz and it says openly in halacha it shouldn't be too full and it shouldn't be too little and so on and so forth. So here we have a very important, very important concept which extends into other areas. The idea is like this. Imagine you go to a pharmacy. You know, they measure, they measure uh, medi medications in, in grams, milligrams, right? You need 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 50 milligrams, too many milligrams could kill you. You know, they, they have all sorts of medicines that, you know, too much. Too much is not good for you and too little might not be effective. If a little bit of antibiotic is good, so I guess the whole bottle is, is really good, right? If a little is good, more is better. But the answer is no, it's not like that. You know, if a little cyanide is good, more is better. No, it doesn't work that way. And, and whatever, sometimes you only need trace minerals. And sometimes you know, there's a reason if you have too much of something and it's not good for you. So uh, um, we have to understand that the spiritual realm is the same way. There are precise prescriptions. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave precise prescriptions. There are prescriptions for the korbanos. There's a prescription for the flour. Imagine that was flour. Imagine that was powder, medicine, medical powder. How much medical powder? Do you have the pharmacist who stands there, you know, you know, you know, measuring out with, with instruments exactly how much to the gram, how much you need. So what makes you think in the physical world if it's that way? It isn't that way in the spiritual world. And if you tamper with it, if there's too much or too little, you don't have, you have not followed God's command. And you have not brought about the necessary effect in the spiritual realm which you're meant to bring about. Why does it happen that we don't necessarily know? We only know that you're giving one. Do you, know, do you understand antibiotics? I still don't understand antibiotics. I don't understand how antibiotics work. I only know that the doctor told me to take it. If you have an ear infection, you take antibiotic. You have a throat infection, you have bronchitis, take it, take it, and it works. Why does it work? I'm not sure, but I know it only works in the, prescription, in the prescribed amount that the doctor says. That's what I'm supposed to do. So when it comes to ruchnius, when it comes to ruchni, when it comes to spiritual pursuits, if there's precision is required in the physical world, so you certainly would need precision in the ruchni world. Remember we spoke about well, tefillin, tefillin being out of place, right? You know the story, this woman, this woman says, uh, says to her friend, wow, you know, we were at your house last Shabbos, they had great apple pie, you know, can you give me the recipe? So she gives her the recipe for the apple pie. My husband loved the recipe, gives her the recipe for the apple pie. And... Uh, Woman called her the next day. She says, "You know, Miriam, I made that apple pie. It just did not come out the way you made it. I don't know something about it." She goes, "Well, did you use the the, the shortening, the type of shortening?" I thought I didn't have shortening, so I used oil. She goes, "I understand. Well, did you did did you use uh, the the right? I told you to use the freshly ground cinnamon, not the store bought." She says, well, "I didn't have cinnamon. So I used oregano." Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, well, did you, did you use the the you know did you use the delicious apples? I told you the big red apples. You know it doesn't work with green apples. So I didn't have apples. I used pears. Right. It's okay. See, see, you you didn't use the short. You didn't use the uh, 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 cinnamon. You didn't use apples. What do you want? It doesn't taste like the apple pie that you made. Right? Why not? Because you tampered with the recipe. That's why. You tampered with the recipe. What, what do you expect? Is you've got an apple, you got a pear oregano cake. You know, mmm, my favorite. <laughs> you know, remind me not to eat it when I have some free time. You know, what, 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 I mean, what, what, what do you want? You tampered with the recipe. That's the way it is in halacha. And that's why we have problems with reform movements, conservative movements, that sort of thing. Yeah, Rabbi Gottlieb told a story once about a guy, um, he's in a, in a college sociology class. So uh, the teacher gets out, and the teacher is, you know, the teacher's not Jewish. He looks through the roster, the names in the, in the, uh, in the roster, and he, uh, he looks at the first guy. He says, uh, he says, Mohammed, you're a, you're a Muslim, aren't you? He goes, yeah. He says, why don't you get up and tell us a little bit about your religion? So he gets up for 10 minutes. He tells us about Islam. 
you know, head chopping, stuff like that. And I thought of the whole, the whole, you know, human, sac human sacrifice, you know, the explosions, that, that, that sort of thing. Okay. The next guy, sorry, I got to get it off of my chest. The next guy, uh, the next guy, what do you call it? Uh, 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 the next guy, he says, uh, O'Rourke, uh, you're a Catholic, aren't you? He says, yeah, why don't you tell us something about your religion? He gets up, he tells us about Catholicism, wafers, wine, that sort of thing. Okay. He gets to, gets to, he says, Goldstein, you're Jewish, aren't you? He says, yeah, why don't you tell us something about a little bit about Judaism? He says, well, I'm sorry, sir, I can't. He says, why not? He says, because I'm reformed. So he looks at me and goes, Goldstein, don't you think you ought to know something about your religion before you reform it? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So Gottlieb said that the Goldstein, and he got hit so hard by that, he went and he became a Balchuva and eventually became involved in college outreach and that sort of thing. One, re one remark by the professor, he goes, hey, guy's right. I know nothing about my religion. I'm reform. What, what are you reforming? <coughs> now, what's our problem with reform? Our problem with reform in general, uh, reform, we, you know, who said you could reform things? Number one, learn about it. Number two, who said you could reform it? But even more than that, you see, why is it, you ever wonder why Salah, remember we spoke about how precise Salah is? And we spoke about the Korban Ola that all of a sudden you're allowed to volunteer service. Remember we spoke about that in the beginning of Parsons by Yikra, how certain things you're allowed to volunteer. On the other hand, on the other hand, Look how precise halacha is, my goodness. You look at every area of halacha. The matzahs have to be, can't be more than 18 minutes. And the, and the, and the dot on the esrog and the, and the hadassim have to be three. Then your tefillin have to be just so and they have to be perfectly square. It, it's so precise. Halacha is so, my goodness, I can't pull tomatoes away from my cucumbers for my salad on Shabbos or you die. <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty precise halacha over there. Why does it have to be so precise? The answer is because it's a recipe. It's a spiritual recipe. And if you tamper with the recipe, you haven't got the original recipe, you haven't got the original product. And our Kodesh Baruch gave us recipes. That recipe is what's going on. That's why you take a Kometz. Not too much, not too little. It's got to be just right. Because that's what the recipe requires. And the person has to know in life. The same way you wouldn't tamper with recipes in the physical world. Don't tamper with recipes. I always tell the women, I say, this is for women. I always have to pick on the men. But the women always say, listen. You do everything good. Women do everything good. Just do one thing. Do your husband's one. Leave raisins out of the house. Right? Raisins are not good for shawl and bias. Right? Women sometimes, women get raisin, raisin trigger happy. You know, well, if it's good, then with raisins it'll even be better. Yeah, but some of us don't like raisins. Right? I like brownies without raisins, and I like chocolate chip cookies without raisins, and I like life without raisins. Right? So, so don't, don't, just because a little bit is good, or raisins doesn't make it better. You know, you know, so don't, just, 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 you know, what do you call it? So, so, so but you don't tamper with the recipe. I also told the women, never tamper with a successful recipe. Women have to know that. If it's good, uh, they, they once said, the great artist knows when to stop. That's the sign of a great artist. If the great artist does, I'm finished. Usually you're always putting on finishing touches, right? Now the finishing touch here, finishing touch here, finishing touch, finishing touch, until you mess up the whole thing. Just stop, stop. You have to know when to stop, right? Don't tamper with recipes. Don't tamper with successful recipes. It works, leave it. I like the brownies the way they are. Don't start tampering and certainly no oregano. This is the korban Aaron and his sons bring on the day they're anointed. Asiri sa efa solis mincha tamid, tenth of a fine efa of a uh, uh, fine flour. Machatzisa ba boker u machatzisa ba erev. Half of it is burnt in the brought in the morning, and half is brought in the afternoon. This is the offering that Aaron and his sons bring on the day that they're initiated into the service. Then the Torah says this pasuk that I skipped down. Ve'akoin amashiach tachtov mi bonod yasos achokol am laHashem kol toktor. The coin who is anointed as Kohen Gadol, every day he would bring a mincha offering, which was divided into two. Part of it he would do in the morning, and part of it he would do in the, at night. So uh, uh, what's the idea? What's the idea of the Kohen uh, bringing the mincha offering every day, number one, and it's divided into two, once in the morning and once at night? What's the idea of the Kohen doing that? The Kohen Gadol. So, so sorry, the Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol. This is the... Specifically, the offering of the coin gadol. What's the idea? So the commentary said like this. Several ideas here. Idea number one <coughs> is to why do we daven three times a day? It corresponds to the uh, uh, to the uh, to, to, to the korbanos. It corresponds to the avos. The avos daven three times a day. That's what the Gemara says is the source for davening three times a day. What's the underlying idea behind it? 
The underlying idea behind it is to stay focused. And of course, it's to make, maintain contact with HaKadosh Baruch Hu all day long. You get up in the morning, you daven. In the middle of your day, you daven. You go to sleep at night, you daven. I told you, davening never comes out at a good time. In the morning, you're tired. At Mincha, you're hungry. And at Meir, you're tired and hungry. Right? So, you have, so you, have, you have what do you call it? You know, three times a day, you're supposed, three times a day you're supposed to daven in order to maintain focus. So the Kohen Godel, who's going to be in the base of Migdash, the first thing is maintain focus. It's like starting your day and ending your day to maintain your focus. You're the Kohen Godel. Stay focused on the Avoda in the base of Migdash, number one. Number two, the Kohen Godel is something. What was the role of the Kohen? What was the role of the Kohen Godel? What was the role of the Kohanim? A guy brought a sin offering to the base of Migdash. What do you think he did? A guy came over with a, with, 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 a, with a sheep. And he gives a sheep to a coin. He says, what happened? I'm going to flip the light switch on Shabbos. What do you think? The coin just took the sheep and then he went and he sacrificed it and he brought it? He gave him lashes. He didn't give him lashes. Lashes is only, boy, boy that's a hanging judge. Right? He, didn't, he didn't give him lashes. He only gave him lashes. The guy did something that, that, that deserved out. The coin spoke to him. Well, you know, listen, you know, it's not the first time this has happened. This happened four months ago also. There was four months ago some incident with the with the borer. I mean, maybe you got to learn a little hilchas shabbos. Yeah, you, 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 the guy, the guy, the job, got a coin is to educate people. Guy comes to the base of me because he didn't have air. Okay, give me the sheep. Bye. You see, you see, you see on the golf course. That didn't work that way. Or yeah, listen, you know, shabbos. Don't shabbos mean enough to you? What you just bring a sheep just like that to the base of me? Just think about what you're doing. Maybe, maybe of course, yeah, get a shabbos cover for your light switches. You know, something. The job of the Kohanim was to educate the people. It wasn't just to bring sacrifice. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't just gas station attendants. The job was to educate people. So if the Kohen Gadol is going to have to give Musr in life, we have a rule. Did you ever hear the Gemara says, Kshot atzmecha kshot acherim. Adorn yourself, then adorn others. It means fix yourself up before you fix up other people. Gentlemen, I'll give you a good piece of advice. Do you ever go to somebody in shul and tell them that his tefillin aren't, 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 aren't straight? Tell them to straighten out his tefillin? If you ever do that, which is very annoying, by the way, uh, I don't know who appointed you on tefillin patrol, but if, 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 you ever, if you ever do that, I mean, once in a while, somebody you, you feel would appreciate being told, so you tell them, just make sure your own tefillin are straight first. <laughs> Sometimes you walk over to the guy, you know, I, I've had a guy, it happened to me once in shul, a guy comes over, he does like this to me. So I looked up at his tefillin, and I tried, you know, I thought he was asking me to, if his tefillin are straight. So as he gets as I started, you know, adjusting, so he goes, and he goes like this. He goes, what way? He's he doing like that. Go, oh, oh, oh he, he was telling me to straighten mine out, not to straight, straighten his out. So if you ever go to tell somebody to straighten something out, make sure, make sure you're fixed up before you fix somebody else in all areas of life. In all areas of life. So the coin Godel, you're going to be telling people, what do you call it? You're going to be telling people to get them so so you also go, you know, bring a Corbin for yourself, or you may also need some atonement. As the Kohen Gadol, you may, you may need some atonement too. Uh, the other idea is that it keeps the Kohen Gadol humble. What offering would you expect the Kohen Gadol to bring? Here's the Kohen Gadol with the chest plate, with the alazachin. What offering would you expect? Ah, gezunta bull into the, into the, you know, bring a big bull into the base of Migdash, you know, with all the hoopla. You know, yeah, and a big knife and uh, some blood and sprinkling, you know, a dun da 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 coin guddles over here. And a coin guddle comes walking in, mm, mm, you know, with a mincha. You know, you got a little pan of flour. Right? Right, 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 right. right. That's to keep you humble. That's to keep you humble. You're the coin guddle. That, that, that's to keep you humble. That, 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 remind you who you are. You know, have, have a mincha. Just like the poorest of the poor bring a mincha, and you bring half in the morning and half at night. Just keep it all in the proper perspective. Remember, the coin guddle is a position of honor. It's a position on it's a very difficult position in order to in order to, to, to make sure you know the story the guy says to the rabbi, he's a chazan in Shul. So he comes to the Rav, he says to the Rav, you know, I have trouble, you know, I'm a chazan and you know, I have trouble staying humble. I mean, there I am leading the entire congregation, you know, it's hard for me to stay humble. So the Rav looks and says, Well, pull the talus off your head, turn around and see how the people are laughing at you. That'll keep you humble. Okay. A guy once came to a gifter, a bacher in yeshiva came to a gifter. He said to a gifter, Rebbe, I'm having trouble with my, I'm having trouble with my, with my, my humility, with my, with my haughtiness. I'm having trouble with my gaiva. So a gifter looked at him and he went, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, <laughs> what have you got to be haughty about? Right, that took care of him. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. how do you like that? I mean, you like that, huh? By the way, I just heard a story about Rav Gifter. Rav Gifter was once asked, by a chassam 
about about washing the dishes. You know, about you know, because his wife wanted him to get ready for dinner. She said to her husband, "When you finish eating, wash the dishes." So they went to Rav Gifter. Husband said, "I don't wash dishes." Went to Rav Gifter. So Rav Gifter said, "Sure, I wash the dishes every Friday night after the meal. I wash the dishes." So they went to the Rebetzin. They said, "Rebetzin, Rosh Hashiva washes. The, I, is that true? The Rosh Hashiva washes the dishes?" She says, yes, every Friday night he washes the dishes. Then he leaves the house to go to the base medrash, and I wash the dishes over. <laughs> Good, yeah? <laughs> then there was the guy who came to Rev Gifter because his wife wanted him, to, his wife wanted him to, to, to wash the floor. And the guy said, it's beneath my dignity to wash the floor. She said, hey, why don't we be beneath the <laughs> So he went to Rev Gifter. He said, Rev Gifter, listen, I'm learning in Torah. I should wash the floor. Rev Gifter said, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You should not wash the floor. Okay. That Thursday night, there's a knock on the door. Who's there? Rav Gifter, standing at the door. He says, Rebbe, why are you here? He says, well, I know your wife needs the floor washed. I came to wash the floor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they get one of those kinds of snap. <laughs> they get a snap. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Rav Gifter, Rav Gifter could, be, could, could be very snappy. <laughs> so, you know, you know, keep yourself humble. Keep yourself humble. Um... All right, just one, one thought on Tainus Esther. One thought on Tainus Esther, very quickly. We're going into tomorrow. Uh, so halachically, you know that it's one of the more lenient fasts. Uh, um, just one misconception. I've mentioned this in the past. One misconception. Why are we fasting on Tainus Esther? Why? The Jewish people fasted on that day. The Jewish people, the Jewish people fasted on that day. What, what day was it? Of, uh, of, it's the 13th of, Nisan, of, of Nisan is, right, right. is when they fast. The so why don't we? Yes, war. yes. Yeah. This is one of the most yeah. common widespread misconceptions because the Megillah talks about Esther saying fast for three days. Right? So everybody thinks Tainus Esther is because they fasted three days when she said so. That's why we're fasting. Those three days were in Nisan. Those three days were during the Pesach Seder. They didn't eat the Pesach Seder that year. Right. So logically, if we're going to fast, it should be for three days, and it should be in Nisa. That's not why. So the halacha says, because on the 13th of Adar, the Jews were fighting their enemies. And whenever the Jews went to war, they fasted. They fasted. And therefore, the halacha says, they were probably fasting then too, therefore we fast. Mm-hmm.